So, you want to see what hides in the darkest depths of the Mario 64 iceberg? Good, you've made it this far, through all the previous levels. But do you think you can handle the strange secrets hidden within our beloved childhood game? Did you know that a sequel was in development before being scrapped entirely? What if Miyamoto stole the idea for Super Mario 64 from someone else? What if this game gave you nightmares? The exact same ones it gave all of your friends too? If you want to know the answers to these questions and more, then let us board Bowser's Sub and finish our journey all the way down into the abyss of the Mario 64 iceberg. Have you ever wandered the castle, only to wonder to yourself why it was even designed that way, with all the hallways and rooms shooting off in odd directions that almost defy the structure you see from the outside? Was this on purpose, or did it just end up that way after the countless redesigns that led to the game's final version? It's a good question, because Super Mario 64 did indeed go through a number of versions before becoming the game we all know and love today. In the earliest versions we know about, Luigi was a playable character too. The castle was a bit smaller from the outside, and Peach's iconic stained glass window is just a generic window texture that can now be found on buildings in wet-dry worlds underwater town. The most drastic change, however, is the inside of the castle, where players inevitably end up spending most of their time in the game. The castle's beta interior featured a much darker color palette, platforms instead of stairs, and a less intuitive layout. We can only guess what the flooded basement section looked like exactly, since it seems that none of the promotional images sourced from the beta version showed it specifically, but it is considered a very important floor for the personalization AI lore. The tale goes that the basement was a testing ground for the personalization AI, a bit like a labyrinth that was changed by an eye in the sky of sorts, as the player played through the game which could give insights into how the AI should personalize the overall game for that player. Diligent fans have noted that the castle does seem to have gotten a bit larger in the final cut, which, to believers of personalization, is evidence that the AI had only grown since the beta, to include more features with which to test players. Navigating the castle can indeed seem a bit like navigating a maze, with so many locked doors, each with different requirements. Some players would inevitably be unable to make it past all of those doors, and thus speculation at what lay behind them could be the birthplace of much of this mythos. Imagining what the game really was is one thing, something that can be backed with research and hard evidence. What the game could have become, in a sequel however, is something that we have little more than imagination with which to rely on. The success of the Nintendo 64 saw the company seek to capitalize on expansions to the console. An infamous, ill-fated expansion, called the 64DD, was released in Japan. It looked to be about the same size as the console itself, but it would add the ability to play magnetic discs, which ended up looking a lot like cartridges anyways. Of course, bringing Mario to the 64DD was a no-brainer, and Mario Artist was one of the few titles to actually release on the console expansion. Nintendo wanted to bring their flagship title, Super Mario 64, to the 64DD as well, as a souped-up sequel that would launch the 64DD just as the original had done for the base console. This sequel project was called a lot of things, including just Super Mario 64 2, but the name that seems to have stuck through time is Super Mario 128, with 128 being twice the number 64. Miyamoto confirmed that this game was indeed in development, but mostly as an experimental project with a bunch of Mario models dropped onto a single spherical world at once. It never released, but according to Miyamoto, the game's development formed the foundations of what would later become Pikmin and Super Mario Galaxy. So it would appear that the sequel was never truly cancelled per se, but rather shaped into new games, no temporal tampering necessary. Speaking of Miyamoto, there's been a rumor going around for some time that Miyamoto and his team stole the ideas that ended up becoming Super Mario 64 straight from another team, Argonaut. The story appears to be that Argonaut pitched Miyamoto an idea for a 3D game based on Yoshi, which was alleged to have been very similar to the concept of Super Mario 64. 
Miyamoto turned the idea down, but ended up releasing Mario 64 not long after. Key people at Argonaut have confirmed that the ideas were indeed similar, but as far as I can tell, neither side has ever made any claims of ownership over the other project's concepts. In fact, Miyamoto even apologized to Argonaut for not picking up the Yoshi concept, since it did in fact turn out to be an ahead of its time idea. If you've ever found yourself particularly and unusually drawn to the music used in Super Mario 64, then you are not alone. Koji Kondo does a wonderful job with the soundtrack for the game, but for some, Kondo's musical prowess does not fully explain why Mario 64's music was so... enchanting. Though not based in reality of any kind, there have been claims online that some of the samples used in the soundtrack were enchanted, i.e. magically imbued, to affect the listener in different ways. Of course, there's nothing mystical about the Super Mario 64 soundtrack other than that it is a wonderful piece of art. Not so wonderful, however, were the tales of nightmares amongst the youth who played the game. It is not uncommon for games to give children nightmares, so the fact that some players incorporated one of the most popular games of all time into their dreams should not come as much of a surprise. The part that was cause for concern among some players, however, were the tales of nightmares being shared between them, like a sort of infection of a sleeping mind. These days, the only stories of shared nightmares that remain from those times are those of Big Boo's Haunt, the spooky theme of which lends itself to such type of dreams, as well as beta versions of the penguins that found themselves on the box art for frosted mini-wheats back in the day. They are a little creepy, I'll give you that. The text string, Delicious Cake, can be found in the game's files, but it goes entirely unused. What was it for, you might wonder? Well, so far nobody seems to know the answer, but the common guess going around is that it might have been used on the end screen, which is indeed where a delicious cake appears. So even though the line was cut, the cake does still appear in the game. This cake was not a lie. There are some not-for-resale versions of Super Mario 64 cartridges that were distributed before and during the game's release for a number of reasons, from testing to promotion to previews and more. These NFR cartridges can be spotted by the not-for-resale text in the corner of the cart's label, but aside from this, there does not appear to be any discernible differences between the NFR cartridges and the final cuts of the game. That hasn't stopped fans from speculating on how the NFR version could be different, though. Lavender Town and Polybius are some of gaming's most popular urban legends. Lavender Town is the story of a town in the original Pokemon games that was purported to make children uneasy, even sick and nauseous. Some theorize this was some strange side effect of the music that played there, and some, of course, saw Pokemon as demonic. The true story is that Lavender Town never made anybody sick. The legend probably stems from the fact that the town is the home of a Pokemon graveyard and is haunted by their spirits. For a game where Pokemon don't seem to ever die, it was simply a jarring experience as a child. The arcade game Polybius was said to make players sick as well. Polybius cabinets were said to appear overnight, drive a few players mad, and then disappear with a couple of black suits behind it. Once again, this is a myth. Polybius never existed at all. Even still, the idea exploded into full-blown conspiracy, with some going so far as to even claim the game was testing or training for children of some sort administered by covert government entities. These two legends have several common threads with the story told on the Mario 64 iceberg and has gained a devoted following not unlike its predecessors as well. For instance, each of these legends claims the game could make you feel sick somehow. It is these similarities which may lead some to believe that they are connected, even seeming to imply that these stories were created to hide the fact that these effects supposedly occurred when playing Super Mario 64. We've made it all the way down the Mario 64 iceberg now, except for one more secret lurking below all others. The final piece of the iceberg's puzzle lay within the idea that every copy of Mario 64 is personalized. You can watch the last video in this iceberg series, a deep dive into that very subject, by clicking the video recommended on screen now. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a quick like and subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks for watching, 
Have a good one.